we've been very privileged to have Kate at Travel Talk and she, she's been a regular speaker since 2013. Her first talk was about Mongolia and uh, about the nomadic herders of Mongolia and her most recent talk was Cycling Vietnam. Kate has, uh, she she has a, a degree with the University of Leicester in geography. In 2010, she gained a PhD with the University of Leicester and she was course director of their certificate in global ecology and wildlife conservation from 2013 to 2019. And she's traveled widely both for her professional career and for her own interest and enjoyment. She started a travel blog when she traveled around the world in 2005 to six. She describes it as a fabulous year spent in three continents, Africa, Asia, and South America, where she had many adventures and met many people. So thank you very much, Kate, for doing this talk for us today. And those of you who are watching on the YouTube, then do please like and subscribe and ring the bell so that you know when we add another video. So thank you very much for joining us. Okay, thank you, Tricia. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, this is a different sort of way of presenting. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy the talk. Uh, the talk's about a trip I made at the end of last year to the Peloponnese, slightly different. And you should now be seeing slides about the Peloponnese. Um, so this trip was made last year in October, uh, I think. Um, and it was, it was just an intriguing place to go, the southern part of Greece. Um, so basically it's the bit of Greece which is that lovely shape of a finger and it was more of a road trip than I usually do uh, in a car uh, rather than public transport because uh, there's quite a few more inaccessible places that I wanted to see um, so it's quite a different trip and it was very much oriented uh, on uh, ancient history uh, ancient history and swimming and seeing the sea um, <laughs> So anyway, I started uh, at the Riandrio Bridge, came down through the west coast, uh, visiting Olympia, further south to the area around Pylos, um, where the Battle of Navarone occurred, uh, around and to the Marni Peninsula, which I thought sounded intriguing, very wild and desolate. Um, through to the area around Sparta and the ancient town of Mistress, um, across and through to Epidavros uh, to see the wonderful amphitheatre, um, a bit of an excursion which I might talk about right at the end, yeah. then up to Mycenae and on to Corinth. Um, okay, this slide for some reason doesn't progress properly, so go back onto the presentation. Okay, very quick brief history of the Peloponnese, which is very much linked to Greek history. It just gives a context to all these ancient sites that I visited, which weren't in historical order, but just in geographical order. Um, so basically the rise of uh, civilizations on the Peloponnese came after the Minoan civilization died down and Mycenae, which we'll visit right at the end of the, uh, the talk, developed as one of the most powerful principalities on the Greek mainland. Then there was a, a sort of dark ages through um, the Dorian era, um, although urban centers such as Olympia uh, were settled, although it wasn't the time of the games just then. Sparta rose as a, a city-state and then you went through the wars get between Athens and Sparta. Um, uh, during the 7th century BC, and then came the era of Roman rule. After that, the Byzantines uh, invaded, so um, there was Byzantine rule from the 9th century, um, and the Franks, the Frankish crusaders, then took over um, 
and Peloponnese was then at that time called uh, the land of Morea. Um, the Byzantines re re-emerged later um, and Mistras became uh, the seat of government. Uh, this is Mistras. Uh, again, most of these settlers chose nice high prominent hilltops to, to create a lot of their settlements as you'll see. Um, and then the Ottoman Turks took over and basically ruled Greece um, with a few uh, little enclaves where the Venetians took uh, control along some of the coastal ports uh, of the Peloponnese, including this one at Methoni. Um, then came the Greek War of Independence. So the Greeks decided they no longer wanted or really didn't want to be governed by the Turkish rulers. Uh, and the British and the French and the Russians all helped take part. Um, and then came the Battle of Navarino, um, which was a turning point. Um, and eventually uh, the Greeks, uh, the Peloponnese and the Greeks uh, gained their independence. And uh, instead of Athens, right at the beginning, one of the settlements on the Peloponnese was the capital of Greece. Um, for the first few years until it moved to, to Athens in 1834. So that really was a, a whistle-stop, uh, <laughs> it really was a whistle-stop uh, history, if you like, of the Greek Peloponnese. So the first approach that um, I saw, very quiet bridge over the Gulf of Corinth, the Rio Andrio Bridge, uh, but it's quite spectacular uh, driving across the bridge and seeing the mountains of the Peloponnese loom up in the distance. Um, quite a long drive because I uh, wanted to get further south quite quickly. Um, and I stayed um, at a, a little uh, b, b guest house and it was... Uh, it was really delightful. It was, it was uh, a pension owned by a farm, local farmer called Theodore, or Theo. Um, and it was set in amongst olive groves and orange trees. Um, and alongside his little guest house, he had a, a little um, Traverna and everything that we, I was eating in the evening was made on the farm. The feta cheese, the olives were grown there, the tomatoes and the onions and the cucumbers, the oregano, the fish was from the sea straight off the coast and, it, and the olive oil was made on the farm. So everything was local. You couldn't really get more local that. And unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of Theo himself, but he was full of the history and the um, the, 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 the ethos of the area really, it was an amazing place to stay um, on the first night. And a very lovely introduction to the Peloponnese. Uh, as they set in these wonderful olive groves, so uh, the olives weren't right. And they're different olives according to whether you want to make oil or whether you want to eat them raw. Um, so lots of different varieties of olive trees within the grounds. Uh, so, and oranges and, um, oh well, not oranges, um, oh pomegranates um, were in the trees all around there. So from there I went and uh, visited Olympia. So this is me, uh, pretending I'm an Olympian athlete coming through the gateway and the entrance to the Olympic Stadium. Uh, and you come through this long tunnel, you can imagine the athletes sort of running down there, and there is the uh, stadium. Now, ancient Olympia, um, the first official games were in 776 BC, um, but the origins of the games themselves probably go back over 4,000 years. And there are various myths about how the games started. Uh, some say that they were founded by Heracles, an amazing athlete himself. Some say um, Olympia, Olympic Games were founded by Zeus after he beat his father, uh, Kronos, at wrestling. So he's decided to continue the games every four years. And the ga games are now still held every four years. 
uh, possibly not uh, this year, obviously. Um, but every year, um, and this is the stadium itself, uh, and did a little uh, jog down and back again. Um, but every year, the ga the ga every four years, the games are held, and the, the Olympic torch is always held here on this stone in front of the Temple of Hera. Um, and the torch is lit there and then carried to wherever in the world the uh, torch, the, the games are to be held. Uh, and that ceremony has actually gone on since 1936. The Temple of Hera itself, which you can see in the background, is the oldest of the temples in Olympia. Um, unfortunately, most of the temples collapsed in an earthquake during the, the 6th century. Um, perhaps the most magnificent temple, although there's very little still standing, was the Temple of Zeus. Um, this was built in between 470 and 457 BC. And again, it collapsed in the earthquake, although they've re rebuilt one of the Doric columns that you can see in the background. Massive columns. I was trying to remember how I didn't take measurements, but the columns at the base must be two to three meters in diameter, quite massive blocks of stone. Uh, interesting in the games themselves, um, it was only athletes that were supposed to take part. Slaves and women of the time weren't allowed to, to enter the games. In, in fact, if women ever tried to bend the rules and dress up as men and enter the games, they were thrown off the top of one of the, the local mountains for infringing the rules of the games. Um, so, and also in the games, um, anyone who cheated um, had to pay huge fines. Um, and then another uh, statue of Zeus himself would be erected with the, the proceeds of the fine. So there again is one of the magnificent columns in the Temple of Zeus. We really get a sense of the ancient history of the games here. This is more ornate, I think they're called Corinthian um, uh, capitals to one of the columns that was lying around on the ground. And they're very, it's quite a, a big site, as most of these sites are, with different temples. This was um, the Palastra. I think this was connected with uh, the water supply there, um, if I remember right. Um, and, sorry, this is the Palastra, um, one of the, the other temples in the area. So quite a be beautiful and large complex to walk around. It was a, a museum also at ancient Olympia. Um, this is the slide of, uh, hold on a minute, let me, oh, sorry, it's lost the, I know it's Dionysius, uh, Heracles, I think. No, Hermes uh, holding the young Dionysius. It's interesting because some of my labels have disappeared on these slides, unfortunately. <laughs> um, this is another, this is a bull statue again in the, the museum and found in the Temple of Hera were masses of these bronze offerings. This one was quite a big horse, but there were lots of these small offerings found. Um, horse racing was particularly um, important game at the time, um, horse events, and these were obviously offerings from the athletes uh, to Hera to do, so they could do well in the games. Um, okay, from Olympia I carried on down the coast and stayed near the, the lovely little town of Pylos. And this is where the Battle of Navarino took place. Um, led by Admiral Codringen, Codrington, the combined British, French and Russian fleets defeated the Ottoman Turks uh, and their allies. And this was essentially one of the keystones in the War of Independence for Greece. Around Pylos are basically, uh, this is the harbour uh, from which they, they set out and the battle took place. Uh, out to see there. This is uh, one of the two 
older castles of the area. This one is in Pylos itself, just the outskirts of Pylos at sunset. Um, and there another lovely view of the, the town and the, the boats itself. I love Pylos, it was a really beautiful um, Greek town on the coast there, these lovely uh, streets, cobbled streets going uphill uh, and shops and little architectural details um, in the streets. And the ubiquitous cat everywhere in Greece, you find cats. Um, whether, whenever you sit down to, to a meal somewhere, there is a cat prowling around under the table. Uh, and fix, sorry, just beautiful uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and pylos at night. Uh, there was two castles around Pylos. This is the one further south. This is the older Palai Castro, set on the hilltop, uh, a few miles south of Pylos, Pylos town. I actually stayed at a campsite between the two. Um, but there's a beautiful walk around some wetlands to take you up to this castle. Um, and through really quite beautiful scenery and vegetation with the, the arid vegetation on one side and the sea on the other, these lovely foxtail lilies appeared all the way up uh, the walk to the castle itself. And the castle is really very ruinous and there's signs everywhere saying keep out, dangerous, but most tourists tend to ignore that. Although walking under some of these gateways you wonder if one of the stones is eventually going to topple down on top of you. But through from the back of the castle, you get this wonderful view of Voidokilia Beach, this lovely hemisphere that's cut off more or less from the sea, not quite. There's a little opening out to sea to the left-hand side there. And of course, I then had to wander around down under the cliffs and around through the sand dunes to swim in this beautiful clear water beach. I told you my holidays were, they, this holiday was all about uh, ancient Greece and swimming and food. So, oh, and there was one of the, there was a whole fluttering of uh, monarch butterflies around in the air on the, the ragwort there. Very beautiful. Just further south from Pylos is another uh, historical site of Methoni again. This is one of the Venetian uh, settlements at the time of um, uh, the Turkish rule, uh, the Venetians had one or two little settlements on the site. They were big traders in the area um, and they built this amazing castle going out onto the peninsula at Methoni. Um, apparently prior to that, Methoni uh, was one of the seven cities offered to Achilles by Agamemnon um, as an offering. Uh, but this is the 15th century Venetian fortress. It was the first and longest held settlement in the Peloponnese. And there's the, the Lion of St. Mark, uh, which is sort of evidence of, of Venetian uh, architecture uh, in Methone. So from uh, the first finger, if you like, of, of the Peloponnese. I carried on uh, through Kalamata, which is famous. I love Kalamata and olives. Uh, Kalamata as a town is uh, basically a big port and harbour, so I didn't really dwell there very long. I wanted to have a look at this weird uh, and mysterious um, area called the Marni. And uh, to the uh, well, it's the, to the east, the, the mountains, the Taigatos mountains rise up in wild and rugged and then they fall down onto the coast of the sea here. So you have lots of these lovely inlets and bays uh, going into the, the sea. So the Marni is this peninsula, the middle peninsula in the south here. Um, it's divided into two areas. The northern part is called the Messenian Marni or the outer Marni. And to the south, right, going right down to the point, you have the Laconian Marni or the Inner Marni. Uh, the northern part, the, um, oh, sorry, it's going to have to come out of that. Okay. No, 
I came back to the presentation. Um, the Northern Marni, the Messinian Marni, uh, is softer, more gentle, though it's got those big rugged mountains, but the uh, slopes of the mountains are full of olive groves. Um, it's a beautiful place to wander. There's lots of good walking opportunities in, in the hills around. I stayed um, at this town, um, Cad sorry, uh, if I can just go back. Um, Cardamilli. Um, so this is the, in the settlement there is the town of Cardamilli. Um, and it was just surrounded, as I say, by these lovely olive groves with the mountains. And inland, the, oh, the town itself, um, lots of cobbled streets, uh, some of these stone towers, which I'll talk about more uh, when I head south into the Marnie. Um, pomegranates again, hibiscus, beautiful little coastal towns, lots of little tavernas, very popular with the tourists, although it was quite quiet at that time of year. And again, a lovely bathing beach right off the pier in the town. Um, a good place for snorkeling, you see, as you can see. And beautiful food once again. The dish at the back here um, is uh, courgette fritters. Uh, I have tried making them at home since. They're a mixture of grated courgette and feta cheese uh, and herbs. What, what's not to like? Absolutely wonderful. And again, another lovely Greek salad and olives, Kalamata olives and local Greek wine. So the food here again was, was wonderful. Uh, okay. Okay, um, so I went for a, a little walk in the hills um, along one of the valleys to see one of a, a monastery um, down in the valley um, and this is the signpost along again the first part wandering through these olive groves along this, this track, very, very well marked track and uh, looking back out to see uh, lots of these Magnificent poplar trees everywhere on the coastline. Um, so fabulous views. Uh, and then coming into the valley itself, I don't know if you see in the center of the picture, there is the monastery right down next to the river in the river valley. And it was just a, a short, short walk really, uh, just to see into the interior of the mountains here. Uh, but it was nice to get out and, and walk for a while uh, rather than just drive around in the car uh, doing the normal sightseeing. Another view into these fantastic hills, really good for hiking. Um, although I know some of the footpaths, there is evidence that some of the footpaths were dangerous and had been closed off. I think it'd be safer with a, a bigger group of hikers to go there. Again, another view back down on the coast of these lovely um, tall, thin poplar trees looking down the coast there. There was other wildlife. This was um, a, a viper that the local cat um, had brought into the com near the accommodation where I was staying. Fortunately, the cat had, had killed the snake before we could get at it and release it. Uh, Vipers are basically our adders, but normally more frightened of us than we are of them. So then I took a, another trip, a, a trip further down in the peninsula. Um, so this is heading south. Um, and as you go south, you transfer uh, from the mountainous areas in, in the north. Um, and it, the land becomes slightly flatter. But you start to see more and more evidence of these amazing uh, stone towers everywhere. Um, and the settlements are, are quite fabulous, quite quiet though, and all scattered throughout the landscape, these little settlements, with these magnificent towers. Um, now this land is also, as well as known as the Marni, is known as Kakavulia, the land of evil counsel. 
And all these towers used to belong to different warring families and clans, because as you uh, drive further south through the Marni or travel further south, the land becomes more and more barren. There's very, very little fertile land. So the families started warring against each other um, to take over different parts of the land. And they built their own stone towers. So each of the stone towers belonged to a different family. They were basically a personal family fortress so they could fight their neighbours. Um, most of the stone towers were built between the 17th and 19th centuries. Um, and these families or clans would basically hurl rocks at each other and fight over the land. And there were various rules to these conflicts. Um, they were aiming to de destroy their rivals' towers. And as also as part of the, the rivalry and the, class, the clashes between the families, it was part of the game to actually murder all the males in the family. The females, they would leave, they could be married off to different families. The males were the ones who were causing the problem. So even the young boys may be murdered by their rival families. So the whole area had this really sinister aspect to it. Many of the towers now, as you go through the landscape, are uh, being restored as guest houses uh, for tourists. So you can actually, if you wish, stay in some of these, uh, in one of these towers. Um, and many of the uh, towns also had personal family chapels. Um, uh, so there was quite an evidence of the, the sort of Christian uh, family chapels so they could uh, invoke help in their family wars. I, I wandered through one or two of these little settlements and it was really quite nerve-wracking because I didn't see anyone. Although you knew people were there, they weren't really present, um, obviously hiding away or off doing business somewhere. But the streets were more or less deserted and all you got were these roads and towers and you could feel the, the presence of the conflict in the past it was very ominous very eerie quite threatening at times uh, to wander around these these little settlements and they say that everywhere you looked in the landscape were different towers no windows they're just purely battlements However, the, the land opened up a little bit further south, uh, came back down to the coast and it was a bit like a, a, a breath of fresh air. Um, and I went on down to one of the small towns at, at, towards the south of the peninsula um, and had a, a, an ice cream and a drink as, as tourists do. Uh, and again, the water was so clear and beautiful. Uh, I managed to swim, not actually here, but at one of the other towns on the way. But this is the evil, the, well, this is the evil eye, or it was used actually as protection against the evil influence, evil council of the land of Kavabulia or, or the Marni uh, and all the opponents on the way. Okay, I'm going to leave the talk talk there because I think we're just about to, to break. I'm just going to go back to the bridge because I know Tricia had asked me about the bridge. I've done a bit of quick research. It's the Rio Antirio Tirio Bridge. It's one of the world's longest. It's 2,880 meters long and it was opened in 2004. So there you go, Tricia. So a little bit of uh, fact on there um about the bridge and if i just go back to another slide uh let's just go back to the map just so we can recap so i've come down the west coast basically uh and we're just leaving the marnie so next destination is mistress uh byzantine settlement near sparta and after that we'll go further north uh, to Epidavros, Mycenae, and I will briefly look at Hydra if we have time, which is a historical site to search, but it was a nice little island to visit. So let's go back down the slides. Um, so we're now back to Mistress, 
um, which is quite close to the ancient uh, area of Sparta, although there's very little of the ancient area of Sparta itself. So this part I'll concentrate on this Byzantine settlement at Mistra. So you drive up to it and the settlement is dominated by the Castro at the top of the hill. Um, but then the town is a convent here and there's a lot of different buildings lower down this hillside here. Um, it's a huge site. It was a, a really steaming hot day. Um, so uh, it was quite hot to, to get around. But I'll give you a, a, a short tour of some of the most uh, important areas. So this is the map of the site itself. Uh, the Castro uh, at the top of the hill, uh, shown at the, the bottom uh, left here. Um, and then the upper town, which was the earlier part of the settlement, including uh, a convent, which is still in use. And then the lower town down here is the, the town itself expanded. Um, so it's a late Byzantine settlement. Uh, it was the capital of the Despotate of Morea. Uh, so despots ruled the area, uh, basically it was uh, a single ruler, there was no uh, elections, it was not a democracy in any shape or form, uh, but it was one of the regions of uh, Byzantium at the time. Uh, the castle itself was built in 1249, um, right on top of this, this wonderful perch on the, on the hilltop here. As I say, many of the settlements, the early settlements, were fortified on hilltops to give uh, the occupiers uh, the chance to see enemies coming across the plains below. Um, so the upper town grew around that castle um, and it, it, it was in existence for um, about 500 years, you know. Um, it was eventually the whole area was ruined by the Turkish um, and destroyed around 1770. Um, but previous to that, it was also part of the Venetian silk trade route uh, through the area. So despite its perch on the hilltop, it was still part of the local uh, trade route. This is the view to, you know, just show you the dominance over the, the local area. So this is the convent, um, slightly lower down the hill, which is still partly in use. Um, there was a monastery also, um, but there are still nuns living uh, and working in the convent itself. And this is back down in the lower town. So you see how the castle just on the top uh, left there dominates behind the, the, the long building further in. And right on the left hand side is the castle just at the top of the picture. Um, but then you get these lovely little Byzantine churches uh, further down in the lower town. This church uh, dates back to about 1295. And again, you've got the lovely Byzantine paintings in the roof of the, the, the cupola at the, the top there. Um, and just some, most of it, as I say, has been ruined. Um, but the ruins are very extensive uh, and you can spend a whole day really. Well, I, I only had a couple of hours, unfortunately. So it was, again, a whistle stop tour. It's just the way I delayed in the day there. Um, but the tour, the tour is amazing if you, if you like ruins and castles and, and ancient sites. So there again is the castle dominating the hilltop <clears throat> over uh, the rest of the area in the convent further on the right hand side there. Very intriguing water system here. Everywhere there seemed to be piped water into different areas. So uh, they were very well catered for. They understand the, understood the essence and need for, for good water supply through the area as well. Um, <clears throat> So from Mistras, um, I carried on um, via the previous capital of uh, the current day Greece, uh, Natflio. Uh, it was only capital for a matter of a few years. Um, <clears throat> and then it moved on to Athens. 
but again another Venetian castle in the sea off the coast of Natfio. I, mean, I really mainly just drove through here. It's, it's a modern, uh, well it's a modern tourist town now, but I was keen to get on and spend some time at this wonderful amphitheater of Epidavros. Um, I'd seen reports about it. I actually stayed at the little coastal town of Epidavros. I hadn't done my research properly then, and then realized that the amphitheater there was called Little Epidavros. And Epidavros, the big theater, the one I want to see, is slightly further inland. But it's a magnificent site. It's not just the amphitheater, but it's the amphitheater that is really quite spectacular. It was built in the fourth century BC out of limestone. And considering it's limestone, it, it's in very good condition. And it is still often used for plays today where classical Greek plays are still performed here on the site. The acoustics are absolutely stunning. So if you stand or a person stands in the center there, um, and even whispers, you can hear them right at the top of the amphitheater. The amphitheater seats up to about 14,000 people. Um, and as I say, the acoustics, I'd love to have seen a play there uh, one day, maybe I can go back. Um, but it's beautiful. There was a, I think there must have been a local drama school, luckily, when I was there, and there was a girl recited something at the center stage. And I went and sat right at the back and you could hear every word perfectly. <clears throat> it was quite stunning. Um, no, that's the view when you send centre stage looking up. And if you can imagine an audience, I can't see any of you, so I'm quite lucky. But you can imagine. <laughs> no, sorry, I didn't mean that in a derogatory way. I mean, <laughs> I meant, you know, sometimes nerves would get the better of you if you're facing 14,000 people. Um, okay, I'll just pause for a minute. There's a couple of questions on the chat. How did I manage the language? Well, most people will speak um, English. Um, and most of the sites, uh, open access, well, you had to pay. Uh, on most of the sites. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, Vertigo, on the, on the, someone said earlier about Vertigo, so Patricia, Patricia, yes, okay. Uh, no, it's absolutely beautiful, the site itself. And most of the sites are open access. Um, while we're in the EU, if you are over 65, you get in for, I think it's a third of the price or half price. Um, but no longer that, that wasn't quite that age anyway, so I was paying full. Um, uh, but uh, I won't say any more about the political situation there, but fabulous site. I think that's all the questions on chat at the moment. Um, so Epidavros is more than just the uh, amphitheatre, there are many temples, it's a massive site, lots of temples to see. Um, it's also, Epidavros is known also, a, a place of miraculous healing. Um, this is in the uh, small museum there. But there are many temples uh, in the area. The legend for the, uh, that goes behind the, the area being uh, a place of healing is that legend says that Asclepius, Sclepius, um, who was the son of Apollo, um, he was trained, he was one of the sons of Apollo, was trained as a healer. Um, and, but he didn't just uh, restrain himself to, to healing, he decided he would start bringing back the dead. Um, at which point Hades, who is the god of the underworld, took offence uh, and killed Scepolis for actually uh, reverting uh, his decisions of who should die or who should stay dead. Anyway, so the area, but the boy was supposed to have lived in the area um, and it, the area is now a uh, sanctuary, Ascapius, and it is, there were areas here, temples that were over the years dedicated to healing. Um, most of them in as many of these sites are a matter of ruins but it's still fascinating to wander around 
and imagine all these temples and places of healing where people can go and I think people still do go and you get the ubiquitous cats sleeping on one of the, the benches in the area um, okay so um, from Epidavros um, I actually did another little trip which I'll talk about <laughs> thanks to Fabulous photo of a cat for those of you who like cats. Thanks, Patricia. Um, I, the next historic site, if you like, I went to visit was the really ancient site of Mycenae. Um, this is the oldest of the sites that I visited. Um, it was the home of the mythical, what was believed to be the mythical Agamemnon. Um, and Mycenae from 1600 to 1200 BC was the most powerful kingdom in Greece. Um, now it's, it's an amazing site, another hilltop site as you can see uh, with the palace of Agamemnon and then there are various royal burial sites, I think this is one of them, uh, in the compound of Mycenae. Um, it's also famous, uh, may been made famous by the Greek author Homer um, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. And in, I think it was the Iliad, he said, he talked about the well-built Mycenae rich in gold. So it's a very rich settlement. Um, Homer also wrote that the city was founded by Perseus. Now, a lot of the legends of Homer were really thought to be just that, just beautiful legends. Um, until more recently, um, the amateur archeologist, I've got a lot of date for that, it was in the 19th century, I think Henrik Schliemann rediscovered both Troy and Mycenae. Um, and there you go, there's uh, Perseus who is believed to have founded this lovely city of Mycenae and next to, to him, uh, Henrik Schliemann, okay, 1877, sorry, 19th century, um, amateur archaeologist and explorer and he followed a lot of Homer's myths and legends and rediscovered both Troy and Mycenae um, and really put what was thought to be myth into uh, a more historical context. So back to Mycenae, the most um, a complete um, artifact there is this the Lion Gate made out of these colossal stones. You can imagine this entrance to the palace of Agamemnon uh, walking up the hillside through this wonderful gateway. Um, and the walls really were quite massive. This, this is the remains of one of the walls leading up to that gate. Um, and I was listening in on a, another tour guide. And these, this wall. Are you there, Kate? I've got a real passion for pottery and the museum at Mycenae was absolutely wonderful. I'm fascinated by these wonderful shapes uh, in, in the clay. And these amphora, they, they're oil jars basically. So they would be designed to stand up in sand to keep the oil or the water cool. Uh, sometimes you would have a, a rack to actually stand them upright. Um, but the, the, they're very stunning shapes. Okay. Right. I've just got uh, probably about um, another five minutes now. Um, and that's really the end of the archaeological trip, if you like, uh, through some of the sites. That are, there are more sites in Peloponnese. Um, sometimes you do get templed out, as many of you will know, when you've been on a tourist site. So those are the ones I decided to visit as the most important and the ones that were on a, a reasonable route to, to visit as I went around the Peloponnese. 
Oh, I did take a little excursion while, while I was staying uh, near Epidavros um, and went south and took a boat trip out to the most beautiful island of Hydra. Um, it's actually only two hours from Athens over the other side of the Sar Sarconic Gulf. Um, and the island of Hydra um, is kept pristine, like we've, we've known over the last few weeks. Once you get rid of cars, the air and the atmosphere changes. And there are no cars on Hydra, so everything is carried by local donkeys through the cobbled streets and the cobbled roads. And the, the ferry docks at the little port, um, it's surrounded by expensive gift shops and beautiful things. But behind those are wonderful alleyways and wonderful staircases. And some of the locals are interesting characters in the right, their own right. Um, again, you know, elements of defence is... The, the, the canon shows, but it was really intriguing walking through these cobbled streets again, almost like the Marnie, hardly anyone there, despite it being a little tourist town, once you got beyond the, the quayside. And I, again, I walked along the coast a little way, finding some beautiful little bathing coves um, and enjoying really the, the, the glittering waters of uh, the, the sea uh, around this beautiful island. Um, the other claim to fame to Hydra is really it was the playground of the rich and famous. Aristotle Onassis uh, had a house here and it was a, a holiday home for Leonard Cohen, uh, one of my favourite uh, singers of my childhood, um, although uh, some people will find his songs rather depressing, I know. But a beautiful um, place to be just for a day um, and lovely, lovely. And just to say, uh, there was supposed to be a thank you message on, on this slide, um, but this slide perhaps sums up my trip around the Peloponnese. Lots of beautiful flowers and pottery and vases, ancient sites, wonderful food, fresh, um, and the lovely scenery, both the coastal scenery and of course the archeological sites. So um, possibly rather a, a short second half. Um, uh, but thank you to all of you for, for listening. Uh,